Well, happy Super Bowl Sunday, and uh, we, are, we are in our uh, Romans 8 series right now. Um, and, and I got to be honest, this is like my Super Bowl. Being able to preach in Romans 8 is like a Super Bowl moment for a pastor. I, I know that sounds extremely pastory of me, and... Um, uh, but, but it really is. It's, it's as if somebody had, had called me up and said like, hey, Kevin, you want a quarterback for the Super Bowl tonight? Like, this is, this is exciting. This is awesome. And uh, I really hope that I do a better job at preaching this message than I would at quarterbacking in the Super Bowl. Um, so just to recap from, from last week, uh, we, we talked, Pastor Ben talked about how in Jesus... There is no condemnation for the children of God. That because of the cross, the children of God are set free. And and this is like the big picture statement. This is the thesis statement uh, that, that, that Paul is making. And then he's going to talk about how the children of God are set free. And, and, and I don't know about you guys, I grew up in church. I, I grew up going to church. I grew up attending church. I, I actually grew up enjoying church. Uh, for some of you, uh, you have a totally different experience. You either didn't grow up in church um, and you knew nothing about it, or uh, you grew up in church, but you hated it. Um, we're all here with different backgrounds and different stories, but one of, the, one of the things for me growing up in church that I would hear people say was, um, I have, I have freedom in Christ. I have found freedom in Christ. And it was something that I never really understood as a kid um, because everything about my church experience, everything I kind of understood uh, was about rules and boundaries and, and, and things like that. And, and, and they were good rules and boundaries, um, but I never really understood what people meant when they said, I've been set free in Christ. Or things like, I'm no longer under the law. Because to me, I was, I was definitely under some kind of law. And I was definitely not free to just do whatever I wanted. That wasn't what it meant to live a Christian life. And, and so... As we, as we approach this text, as we approach this section of Scripture, Romans 8, 5 to 17, as we, as we open this up, um, I believe that Paul has kind of the answer to, to what these statements, where they, where they kind of lack, he's got the answers to why we can find freedom in Christ and why we are no longer under a law. So, as we open Romans 8, 5, 517. Let's read this. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God, It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, even though your body is subject to death, even though your physical body is is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of His Spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation But it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if the Spirit you but if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. 
The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. And so, as we read this passage, you may have noticed the contrast between, the, the, that Paul is doing, he's doing this contrast between the flesh and the spirit. He is going back and forth. He's talking about the flesh and then he's comparing it to how the Spirit, living by the Spirit is. And and there's tons of different things going on in this passage and so many different things that we could talk about. But I want to get focused in on on two particular things. And it's these two things that that Paul uh, brings up. It's the flesh and the Spirit. And so, we're going to start with what Paul starts with here, and we're going to talk about the flesh. The flesh. Um, And and this this is kind of the problem that that Paul sets up in chapter 7, as we we read last week. And if if you have an opportunity to read chapter 7 again, I encourage you to do that. He, He essentially says, this is the story of humanity in a nutshell. Um, That we've been given God's law, a way in which we are to live, uh, that will lead to life. And we could sum up that law in the Ten Commandments that we find in the Old Testament, but we could even narrow it down further to what Jesus says in the New Testament. And we could boil it down to two simple commandments, love God and love your neighbor. And so what Paul is saying in chapter 7 is he's saying we've got this good law that God has given us. But if we fail to live under that law, we have put ourselves under a different law. If we fail to love God and love our neighbor, then we are putting ourselves under the law of sin and death. And, and this is a huge problem in, in our world today. And this is where Paul starts to talk about the flesh. He says to live by the flesh is to live under the law of sin and death. He says that the flesh is about a sinful and corrupted humanity. This is what he is talking about when he talks about about the flesh. Now, for those of you who haven't grown up in church, for those of you who, who don't quite understand the churchy kind of language here, we, we use the word sin a lot, and I think we don't take some time every once in a while to define what we really mean when we talk about sin. Because especially the way that Paul uses it and the way that it's used throughout Scripture, sin actually has multiple uh, meanings. And, and, and in fact, the way Paul is using sin, even in this passage that we've just read, you can hear that there are, there are two different ways that we can interpret this. The first is the very simple understanding of sin as a verb. Sin as a verb, as action. It's the actions that we take or the actions that we refuse to take. It's exactly what Paul is talking about in Romans chapter 7. It's the things that we know that we should do that we don't do. Or it's the things that we know that we shouldn't do that we do. That is sin as a verb. And it's it's often actually used as, it's an archery term. It means to miss the mark. And so when we miss the mark of what we are supposed to do, we are sinning. When we fail to love God and love our neighbor, we are sinning. When we tell a lie, we are sinning. When we worship other gods, we are sinning. When we commit adultery, we're sinning. When we steal, we're sinning. I think you get the picture. These are the things that we do or don't do. 
But Paul talks about sin in a second way, and in a way that is not often talked about. He talks about sin as a noun. Sin as, as its own kind of entity unto itself. In chapter 7, he says, he says that it's not him who does these things, but it's actually sin living in him. He talks about sin living in him. And this is not something new that Paul is bringing up. This is actually uh, a very old way of looking at it. In fact, the very first time that we hear the word sin, we hear it here in Genesis 4, 6, uh, the second half of 6. Uh, God is talking to Cain here, and what he says to Cain is, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. See, sin, sin is also a noun. It's something active. It's something powerful. And, and the way that it's described here in Genesis, it almost seems as if it is like an animal. It's crouching at your door and it desires to have you. Some translations actually say it de desires to devour you. And so I, I'd like to illustrate what this, what this is kind of like by, uh, by talking about this, this urban legend. Um, and, and it's about a woman who had a pet python. Now, already we know that this woman is crazy because who on earth would ever have a pet python? That is insane. Now, as a side note, I will say, personally, I am terrified of snakes probably to the most extreme version that, that, that you, could, you could find. In fact, um, I was telling our young adults about this uh, one Monday, and then the following Sunday, we had started construction here at the church, and, and somehow a snake made its way into the church. I'm, not, I'm actually not sure that it wasn't a young adult pranking me, but a, a snake made its way into the church, and as I opened the door to the office... Um, to, to just grab some stuff in between services, there he was on the ground staring into my soul. And I was terrified. It was the most medium-sized garter snake I have ever seen. And it was awful. I had to get somebody to rescue me from this. And to this day, I still check my office for snakes. This is, this is why I think this woman is crazy to have a python in her house, a python. Now, it's said that this woman, she loves her python. She loves this pet so much. She just lets it uh, roam around the house. She doesn't really keep it in a cage. And in fact, um, what she does is she lets this python sleep with her. Ugh, so creepy. <laughs> but... Um, one day, this python started acting weird. It wasn't, uh, wasn't eating anymore, um, and, uh, and, and it was just kind of acting a little bit funny, not doing its usual uh, behaviors. And, 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 and when the python would sleep at night, uh, it was no longer coiling up beside um, his, his, his owner. In fact, what he was doing was he was stretching out, and it almost seemed as if maybe, maybe this poor python had a tummy ache. And, and so, um, so this woman takes her python into, um, into the veterinarian office and uh, the vet says to her, uh, is just like, okay, well, what do you think is wrong here? Explains the situation and as she's talking, the vet's eyes widen and she gets terrified. This terrified look on her face and she says, do not ever sleep with that python again and the woman is just like she's kind of taken back she's like what what do you mean and she says she says listen the reason the python isn't eating the reason it's stretching out at night beside you is because it's trying to decide whether it's time to eat you Ugh, so creepy so creepy and, and although if you know anything about snakes i'm not trying to 
spread fear of snakes or anything like that. But, but if you know anything about snakes, this is more than likely an urban legend. Um, but it is something that is believable because we have heard the stories. We have heard the stories of owners of, of these, these snakes, these pets who have... Um, they have turned on their owners and they have constricted them. We've heard of the lions, the tigers, the bears. I really hope somebody said, oh my, there. Um, and and, and, and we, we've heard these stories and, and we know that, that a lot of them are true. The tiger who mauled his owner to death. And this is the same picture that the Bible gives about sin it's crouching and it has a desire to devour you this is the same picture it has this strange power and it must be overcome this is why addictions are incredibly difficult because it's not just about the action there is an actual power behind it And this, this, is why, this is why in chapter or in verse 13, Paul says the misdeeds of the body, the flesh, sinful humanity must be put to death. And, and often, often like these dangerous pet owners, we um, we hold on to our sin. We, we, we maybe have this conversion experience with Jesus and um, we say that we want this new life, but then we are holding on to these dangerous pets and in fact, we're showing them off to people. Hey, look at my tiger. Look at this thing. Isn't it incredible? Don't, don't worry. No, no, no. He's so calm. He's so gentle. He loves me. And, and you know what? Not dangerous at all. I let him, I let him sleep on the couch. And what I want to tell you here today is much, much like I would probably say to somebody who owns one of these pets, I want to say this about your sin. It doesn't love you. It doesn't care about you. And it hasn't been tamed. You've just been feeding it. This, this is the illustration of sin that Paul gives us when he talks about the flesh. He says it's like an animal ready to devour you that the second you stop feeding it, it will attack. But Paul, Paul doesn't leave us without any hope. He's of course contrasting it with the Spirit. And we need to talk about what we mean by the Spirit here. We are not talking about the human spirit. This is not some kind of self-help. Uh, just dig deep within you and uh, you, will, you will find uh, the power that you need to overcome this. This is not about uh, you just doing a better job because just as living by the flesh was both a verb and a noun, when we talk about living by the Spirit, we are also talking about a verb and a noun. We are talking about the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead. We are talking about the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead. It is, it is an active power that we can have access to. And we can have access to this. This is what Paul essentially says. He says that living by the Spirit is to unite your life with Jesus and live under His law. Living by the Spirit is to unite your life with Jesus and live under His law. And, 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 and this is why he's going back and forth. He's talking about there's this power over here that seems to have control over your life, but there's the greater power that you can have access to. This is what he means when he says in, in Romans 8 chapter, or, sorry, Romans 8 verse 3, this is what he means when he says that God condemned sin in the flesh. He means that there is a power, there is a power that is 
far greater than the power of sin and death. And as theologian, author, and pastor Greg Boyd puts it, he says, I submit that the cross reveals that God's power is precisely God's loving willingness to be profoundly impacted by others and to suffer at the hands of and for the sake of others. He goes on to say, it's thus a kind of power that is patient and kind and does not insist on its own way. And it endures all things. It's the opposite of the coercive, I get things my way power that the world, or as we've been talking about, the flesh lusts after. This, this is what Paul is talking about. He's saying that we have access to live by the power of the Spirit. We can be free from addiction. We can be free from bitterness. We can be free from anger, lust, jealousy. Whatever sin is holding on to our lives and wants to devour us in this moment, he says, you don't have to live under it anymore. He says that you can be free from the law of sin and death. And this is what Paul means, and this is ultimately what we mean when we say that we have freedom in Christ and that we are no longer under the law. We are no longer under the law of sin and death. And in fact, what we can do is just what Jesus did on the cross, and that is to condemn it. We can put it to death. This is, This is what Jesus is encouraging us to do. Don't keep it as this cute little pet that is going to end up devouring you. He says, put it to death. I'd like to share with you Maddie's story. And her story is a story of slavery to sin and living by the flesh. But it is also a story of killing the flesh and living by the Spirit. Check it out. Hi, my name is Maddie Smiley. I'm 25 years old and I've been going to Southgate for about six years right now. God has blessed me so much over the years and I know that he wants me to share my story today. I grew up in a loving Christian home with two loving parents. I learned and read the truth about God my whole life, but it wasn't until I had to go through my own struggle and journey to find him as my personal savior. From a young age, I've always remembered battling with insecurity, self-image, and needing to be pleased by everyone. This shone more during my high school years, when those insecurities soon tapered into an eating disorder, which little did I know, as hard as it is for me to say, it caused me to dapple into bulimia, which soon started to be a six year long recovery of addiction. It started to take away my life I once knew. The friends in college became the people I wouldn't normally surround myself with. And the ones that loved me the most, I would push away the most. I felt completely out of control and I was no longer the Maddie that I once was. I knew that I wanted to get my life back, but the only way to to do that was to stop completely. So I decided to take matters into my own hands. I would take myself to bookstores, read self-help books. I even spent money on recovery courses online, anything I could do to get my hands on just to finally live a normal and happy life. Even though that idea seemed so distant to me. I would always manage to have the willpower and motivation to get better on my own, but after a few months, I would always find myself back to square one, even more confused, ashamed, like before. As my husband, Trav, and I started to date, that's actually when I attended Southgate for the first time. One weekend on a particular Sunday morning, I had just gone through another relapse again from me trying to get well on my own. This time, I really felt like I had lost all hope, and I just accepted that I would be like this forever. On that Sunday, I remember clear as day, Ben preaching on the book of Job, how Job had lost everything that he had ever loved and owned, even including his entire family. Job had no idea that his life on earth could get any better than it did. 
until it did and there ended up being a whole other chapter of God restoring what Job had lost and even more. I remember Ben saying something around the lines of, I don't know who you are today, but there are some of you that feel like Job in these chapters. But I want you to know that there's still a whole other chapter that you don't even know about yet that hasn't been written. When I heard that, my eyes just welled up in tears and my heart just went so fast. I actually felt hope for the first time. I knew it wasn't another pump of motivation or empowerment to start the next formula or the next book that worked for someone else, but it was the knowledge that God would be behind me every step of the way and we were now going to fight this thing together. Looking back at that experience, I can tell you that was my, when my true road to recovery began. A few months later, my mom found a place called Mercy Ministries in BC. Mercy is a Bible-based program for women to help deal with life-controlling issues, find freedom through Jesus. I applied and soon enough, I attended there for six long months. The first day at Mercy, I realized I needed God more than ever before. I needed to rely on Him to get me through and keep me there. I learned more about His love for me and I grew a relationship with Him so strongly that I've ever felt before in my life. I've never felt God so real in my life. I was able to speak to counselors every week and we were able to break down the root of where those insecurities lie that caused the eating disorder. It was the most difficult, but honestly the best thing that I could have ever done for myself. I know though, I would have never been able to do it without God's help and him know knowing that he was beside me the whole way. And he never let me down once. The Lord used Mercy Ministries to completely transform my life. Coming back home was no unicorn and rainbows, let me tell you. But I, what I never lost was God's unfailing love for me and that he would still be with me wherever I went, even after Mercy. Coming home, the verse that really helped me get me through was when the time when the tough times did come up again was 2 Corinthians 5:17. Therefore if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and see the new has come. Now fast forward now, so 4 years, God has blessed my life over and over. Just to name off a few, I'm now married to my best friend who's literally the perfect match I would have ever never even thought for myself. He's allowed us to receive an amazing price on our first home in Stittsville, which doesn't even make sense with the market we have going on right now. And on top of it, we will be now welcoming our new baby girl home in any day now. I can say now that the addiction I once had has no power over me through the blood, or through the power of Jesus Christ. Even though it was brought on myself and it was from my own doing, God still loved me so much to restore and forgive me from my own mistakes because that's just who he is. Now that I have all these blessings now, I know I would have never experienced these in my life if I hadn't relied on God's presence with me through the trials and let go of me and rely on his strength. I am living proof that he does bring beauty to ashes. Just to end off, one of my favorite verses, yet so simple in the Bible, is Psalm 71, 14. As for me, I will always have hope. I will praise you more and more. All right, so I'll just do the online follow-up here. What a powerful story. What a powerful story. And stories and, and music, they, they often have a way of connecting the head to the heart. They have a way of, of bringing it into, into reality. And, and for me, um, I'll say this, music has always been um, a passion of mine. It, it's been something that, that I've, I've gone to um, constantly to get this head to heart kind of movement and so I've always listened to uh, different kinds of music, and I know that my music tastes are not the same as everyone else, and, and, and I like to listen to some, some of the heavier music, some of the heavier stuff, and, and surprisingly to a lot of people, there is some very good um, stuff out there that is, that is heavy, it's aggressive, but it has a very powerful message. And so... Um, I want to read some lyrics to you. These lyrics were, were a song that was essentially on repeat as I wrote this message because it was so applicable. And, and if, you're, if you're keen, you can check out the song. I am going to warn you ahead of time. It is very 
very heavy. Um, but there is an acoustic version, which is uh, much lighter, much more accessible. So if you want to check that out, feel free to do that as well. This is a song called Relief by Wolves at the Gate. And uh, the lyrics here are from the chorus and the bridge. And so I'm just going to read to you. All who are burdened and seeking respite, all who are hopeless, wretched, and desperate, all who are worn out and feeling oppressed, come in and find your rest. For all confined, come be set free. For all the blind that long to see, come and receive the perfect relief. Come and believe he bore your grief. It has a way of taking the head and putting it into the heart. And I pray that, that today has been helpful for, um, for just bringing to light some of what this passage is saying and how it can apply to our everyday lives. And so I just want to go back and I want to read this passage once more and I hope, I hope that it has a little bit of new light shed on it. So Romans 8, 5-17. To 17. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live according to the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of His Spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but not to the flesh, to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves. So you no longer have to live in fear. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by Him we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in the sufferings in order that we may also share in His glory. Ultimately, what Paul is saying here, what Paul is cleverly devising in this passage as he's saying there's a type of living that is death. And there's a type of death that is living. There's a law that leads to slavery. And there's a law that leads to freedom. Put, to, put the flesh to death. Live by the Spirit. Free yourself from the law of sin and death. And find freedom in God's law. So I've just got two simple next steps for you today that line up with this teaching. Um, the first step is this. Unite your life with Jesus. Uh, Paul says that, that, that if, we haven't, um, if we haven't given ourselves over to Christ, then the Spirit doesn't live within us. And, and so what he is saying is in order to access this power, in order to, to get at the thing that will give us freedom, we have to unite our lives with Jesus. 
But he doesn't say that it's just this magical, as soon as you unite your life with Jesus, everything is taken care of. It's not a one-time deal. What he says is that we then need to continue to put the flesh to death. And so, if you're here today and you've already united your life with Jesus, but you know that there are areas of your life that you are living by the flesh, you need to kill it. And, and, and Paul tells us that we have access, we have the ability to do that by the Spirit of God, the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead. And I hope, I hope that that gives you hope today. I hope that if you are, um, like that song said, if you are burdened and feeling oppressed, that you would be able to find your rest in Jesus' 